Check, check, there it is, all right. Well, good evening, happy, chatty people. It's, I like that, I like to come out here at seven and see everyone just chit-chatting and having a good time. Makes me happy. Good to have you out tonight. Danny Donnelly is here to lead us in worship, and we're gonna be beginning the book of Psalms tonight. So uh, a new book and a, a new journey and a new adventure. So why don't we all stand for opening prayer, and we'll commit the night to the Lord. God, we are blessed to be here, and we thank you, as always, for your goodness to us. We thank you for your blessings upon our lives. We ask and pray as we gather here tonight, Lord, that you would meet us here as we come into the sanctuary, and that you would just meet us on this 12th of March here in the house of the Lord, and we'd have our hearts prepared to sing songs to you and to receive of your word. And Lord, as we begin a new book tonight and a new journey, we pray, Lord, you'd really speak to us as we begin this journey in the Psalms and that your word would touch us in a new way through another, yet another one of the poetic books. So we give you, we dedicate to you this new beginning in the book of Psalms that will take us for a while. And of course, the worship with Danny to prepare our hearts and just to be even in the moment with you singing praise and worship. So we give you the night, have your will and your way, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening to you. Great to see you. When I think about the Lord, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me up with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up, turned me around, how he set my feet on solid ground. It makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord you're worthy of all of the glory all of the honor all of the praise it makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord Sound hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory, all of the honor, all of the praise. Yeah, yeah. And it makes me want to shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory. All of the honor, all of the praise, oh, all of the praise. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory, all of the honor, all of the praise. Oh, and it makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory, all 
to die poured out for all mankind God's only son perfect and spotless one he never sinned but suffered as if he Oh 
Sing a simple song of love to my Savior, to my Jesus. I'm grateful for the things you've done, my loving Savior, precious Jesus. That you call me your own There's no place I'd rather be Than in your arms I love In your arms I love Holding me still Holding me
our confidence is in God alone. The shelter of my Father's throne, I will not run when the storms have come to me. My confidence is in Jesus Christ and in the blood he sacrificed. He paid my way and he lives today. trust yes he is my confidence he's my rock he is my rock he is my fortress he is my confidence oh my confidence is in the word of life the sword of truth with which we fight is power proclaimed and I am not ashamed to say oh he is my hope he is my trust yes he is my confidence he is my Father's grace, the mercy in His holy face. I truly love all oh, the glory of His name. Oh, He is my hope. He is my trust. Yes, He is my confidence. Sometimes when I play this song, uh, if we sing the chorus after He is my rock, maybe we could just, uh, kind of like the way in a Jewish wedding when they break the glass. Have you guys ever been to a Jewish wedding? But it's like, that's it. You guys are together. And it's just you two, you know. So maybe we could uh, kind of break the glass as we say, He is my rock with our hands, you know what I'm saying? For he is my hope, he is my trust, yes, he is my confidence. Here we go. He is my rock, he is my fortress, he is my confidence. One more time, here we go. For he is my hope, he is my trust, yes, he is. We 
maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Lord, we thank you that when we need hope, Lord, you are our hope. That it's always there, the, the hope of heaven, Lord, the hope that we know that you said that, we're, that you're preparing a place for us to let not our hearts be troubled. That we could say you are, Lord, you are our, you're my trust, Lord my confidence, my rock on which I stand. When the world seems shaky, Lord, you're our rock and our mighty fortress. That in this world we could just, in a moment, Lord, just feel so unconfident about anything. And in a moment we could just be reminded that, wait a second, Lord, you're our confidence. That you say that we're your, we're your treasure, Lord, your joy. For the joy that was set, for be, set before you, Lord, endured the cross, Lord, despising the same for us, Lord, that we're your joy. And uh, tonight we're so thankful to be in this place. I know I'm so thankful to be in this place, Lord, to, to have you light our path, Lord, as Joey shares from your word. And uh, our confidence is in the word of life, as we sang the sword of truth with which we fight. And we're not ashamed, Lord. We're not ashamed to say that you're our hope, our trust, our confidence, our rock, our fortress. And uh, tonight we want to just give all the praise to you, Lord. Even as we, we're, we're listening and as we're, um, read, as we're diving in and reading and as Joey's sharing, Lord, um, I know you want to just speak to us personally, Lord, each one of us, where we're at right now. Um, that's what you do, Lord. It's, it's like a miracle every, every week, Lord. We get to hear from your word, and, and as you, uh, you just shine it into our path. Uh, be blessed, Lord, as we lean into you tonight and, uh, and just give you, our, give you our all, all of our attention tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to turn to somebody and say hello. We need a little more clapping around here. <laughs> All right, well, once again, good evening, everybody. Great to have you out on this Tuesday night. And just a couple announcements for a Tuesday. This coming Saturday is our food and fellowship night, the first one of the year. We're going to have Mexican food in the gym there after service. So if you can make it out Saturday, make sure you come out ready to enjoy a meal and have some fellowship with uh, your brothers and sisters here at Worship Generation. I hope you can make it. It's going to be a great night and very excited about it and looking forward to it. Been praying for it and I just know it's going to go awesome. So hopefully you can be here. The next Tuesday is a communion night. So if you come out next Tuesday, kind of prepare your, your heart there for that. And we're going to have uh, Giovanna Bush will be out to lead us in worship. I've been mentioning this, so she'll be here to lead us in worship. And, you know, she's pregnant and she's moving in. I think she's in her third trimester right now. So, you know, we're, 
you, you just don't know when she has a child, like when we're going to get her back. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you can think this way before your first child, but you mothers know after you have that child, you might have to recalibrate what you think you can do or can't do. So let's enjoy Giovanna Bush when she comes out next Tuesday for communion service. And so that's next week. And then the following week is Passion Week, what we call Passion Week with Easter coming upon us. And Jeff Anderson will be out to lead us in worship on that Tuesday night solo. And then have the full praise band here on Saturday the 30th as we celebrate Easter service. So that's our schedule for the month, and I hope you can be a part of that. Tonight, we're going to begin a new journey in the book of Psalms. And, uh, it, you, know, you know, you don't really know what to expect. Like, I'm just going through the Bible, verse by verse, as you know, on Tuesday nights. And, you know, I just kind of think what a journey it's been. We, with Genesis, we began in July of 2019. And then, you know, I go back to Leviticus and we're outdoors during COVID with the helicopters and the motorcycles and all that stuff and just everything. And it's like, what a, what a journey it's been uh, going through the Bible. And so we finished Job. That's done. And I really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed Job. And it was quite an experience to teach it verse by verse and a lot of text. But the beauty when we shift, so we're in poetic books. That's the first of the five poetic books. And tonight we're shifting to Psalms. And uh, the beauty of the Psalms is that well, it's the biggest book in the Bible. It's the most text in the Bible. And essentially, there's five books that make up the book of Psalms. It's so unique because it's poetry, it's prayers, and it's songs. And really, if you think of Ecclesiastes 3, where it says there's a time and purpose for everything under heaven, pretty much the Psalms get everything under heaven in one of the Psalms, one way or another. In the New Testament, when Jesus was risen from the dead and appeared to the apostles, he said that it's the scriptures that declare him, that the law, the prophets, and the Psalms declare him. And so he actually literally would direct the New Testament believer to look at the Psalms and look for Jesus prophetically spoken of in these books. So when we think about going through Psalms together, the book of the Psalms, and these 150 Psalms, which do declare Jesus at various points in times. They're also quoted by the New Testament at various points in times. They cover like a thousand years. So we have a prayer of Moses, which would put us at about 1500 BC. And then we have things attributed to like Ezra, which puts us at about 500 BC. This is a very unique book in our Bible. And when David Downs was here a few months, excuse me, a few weeks ago, the missionary from Italy, he saw that we were in Job, and he says, so are you going to do Psalms verse by verse? I'm like, of course, what else are we going to do? That's what we're going to do. And he goes, how do you do Psalms? Like, how do you teach Psalms? I'm like, one at a time, right? <laughs> so uh, it's like driving across country on the I-40. How, how, do you, how do you get it to Wilmington? Well, you start by, you know, going by San Bernardino, you know, and then off you go, right? So anyways, or Barstow, whatever, out, you, you're going you're gonna, to one step at a time. And so when I come to the Psalms, I want to have a plan like, how am I going to teach the Psalms? Because I have taught the Psalms verse by verse here at Worship Generation before. But I thought, well, for sure we want to, one of my goals as the pastor teacher of this book over the next six months, whatever it's going to be, is to make sure I don't miss the Jesus verses, all right? So uh, that's a goal every Tuesday before I'm cleaning everything up and working on the study to just cross-reverence and make sure that when we have a, a clear Jesus passage, I want to make sure I get that to you. So that's my number one goal, which it always is. Where's Jesus like uh, in the text in the Old Testament? But the Jesus verses. Also, I want to try and make sure we have a New Testament verse, a verse from Psalm that's quoted in the New Testament that I can reference that to you so we can make the connection from the Psalms with the Holy Spirit and the New Testament writers. So I want to do that as well. And then with the ebb and flow, there's a different cadence to different psalms. Like, right, Psalm 119 could take two nights for all I know because it's the Hebrew alphabet in a sense. But then there's some psalms that are short. And so it's like there's really no master plan to how to teach the psalms with a continuity other than as we go through each psalm verse by verse, I'll be looking to either draw out something, uh, a thought from that psalm it might be material that we've seen a lot of in that context of other psalms. So it might just be a thought, but every psalm is here for a reason. So we want to pull something out of that psalm for sure. And in some cases, it might be a more profound application where it just really gives us something that we want to say, let's, let's get off at this exit. Let's, let's, 
Let's have lunch here. Let's think about what this psalm is saying and what it means to us. All right. So um, if you go home tonight saying Joey doesn't seem to have a, he's all over the place. Like if you do that in a three or four weeks, you're not like, yeah, well, I'm figuring out just like you are. But one thing for sure is we're going to go verse by verse in the context with each psalm, and we're going to get our thoughts from the Word of God contextually, and we're going to get our applications. And again, I really want to make sure that where there's a Jesus passage, we get it clearly and definitively, and there's a New Testament connection, we can connect that to the New Testament. And of course, again, key thought in an application, at least a key thought from every psalm, if not a application that's solid. So with that in mind, tonight we'll begin with Psalm 1, one of our favorite psalms. I love how the book of Psalms starts with just a a hall of famer right off the bat. Psalm 1. And as we come to Psalm 1, we come to book 1 of the psalms, which is 41 psalms. And these are all attributed to the great King David, written around 1000 or 1100 B.C. And again, just another footnote to the history of the book. David encompasses about 50% of the Psalms, and about 25% of the Psalms are accounted to anonymous. And then you have Solomon and Moses and some mixes there that are sons of Asaph that we can see, but David is the dominant Psalm writer by declaration within the Psalms. So he starts us off, and we're going to be with David for a while in this first book of the Psalms. Psalm 1. Verse 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by a river of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The strength of this psalm really is the righteous woman or the righteous man who delights himself in the law of the Lord and meditates on it. That's, that's the apex, the high, high tide watermark of this psalm. That's the big positive. But so often, as we see, and we'll get a lot of this in Proverbs, the positive is understood by contrast to the negative. Like, God has contrast, right? Light and darkness, heaven and hell, truth and falsehood. Our universe is filled with contrast. And we will see this time and time again in the psalms, as well as, again, when we get to Proverbs, we'll see it a lot there, a contrast. So, to understand the blessing of the woman or the man who delights himself in the law of the Lord and, on, and in his law they meditate day and night, we first have to understand the ungodly. It's a contrast. So the psalm starts out with the ungodly. That is that the blessed man or woman is the one who does not associate or hang out with the ungodly. And I'll point out this phrase ungodly is used four times in this psalm. And this psalm kind of goes back and forth like, Blessed is the man you know, who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly and, and these things. And then it comes back to, but does this rather delights himself in the law of the Lord and meditates day and night. And then it goes, after saying that that person's prosperous like a tree, bringing forth fruit in due season, it goes back to the ungodly. So it kind of like a, like a little, it's like this and, and then like that, okay? So we got to keep that in mind. And we see right away that what, a, what the blessed woman, blessed man is not like. And it's interesting, the progression of the ungodly. It says, who, blessed is the man or the woman who, who walks not. So the blessing is immediately identified by where we're not, what we're not doing, what we're not associating with. Who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Ungodly people have counsel. Check their counsel. There's bad counsel out there. There's ungodly counsel. There's a, a biblical word of God worldview, Christ-centered, and there's an unbiblical antichrist worldview. And there, there are many opinions even about both. But the counsel of the ungodly is bad counsel. And so walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. But see the progression from walking to standing, nor stands in the path of the sinner. So you walk with someone and then you stand with them and you hang out with them. So maybe you're sharing a journey, but now you're, you're hanging out with them. You're in the same mob. You're in the same crowd with the sinner. And then you sit down with them to sit with the scornful. This passage reminded me of 
that Zig Ziglar comment, he said, so often the studies back in the 80s showed that the greatest indication that you'll be promiscuous before marriage sexually, do drugs, smoke cigarettes, or do alcohol, is the amount of time you're exposed to people who do the same thing that you hang out with. And anyone successful business would tell you, successful business will tell you that you're generally the sum total of the five people you hang out with the most. That's why we're always trying to hang out with birds of a feather that flock together to be like-minded and, and be with people who, as iron sharpens iron, and people that build you up and they challenge you intellectually and spiritually and those sorts of things. And you may not know them in your life personally, but you can listen to them on K-Wave and on podcasts and you can buy their books, the right books, and fill your mind with the right influences, godly influences. As I've said many times, I am so grateful. I was at the Calvary Bookstore yesterday, and I saw all those Elizabeth Elliot books. The great saint, Elizabeth Elliot, who's been with the Lord for a while now, the wife of the missionary there in Ecuador who was martyred by the Aka Indians in the 50s. And I think how many of her books I read. And I'm so glad that when different things come up in my life, I immediately reference things that I was discipled by Elizabeth Elliot from. Having never met her, you know, like... I have autographed books by her, but through Gates of Splendor and, but I'm so profoundly influenced by this woman or the Pastor Chuck Smith books, How, all those books of Chuck, Pastor Chuck that I read, that they shaped me. They'll keep you from walking with the wrong people, the ungodly. They'll keep you from standing with sinners and sitting with the scornful. And as I was saying today, when I was working on this passage or this chapter, I thought back to how different my life would have been had I never smoked pot, cannabis, when I was 13. You know, I got out of smoking weed for a while, hanging out with those surfers in the 70s at junior high. And the way I got out of it is I said I was allergic to marijuana. I did. I said I was allergic to weed. And I have to tell you, it worked for a while. That'll work, you know, here in this random situation. It might work there, and it might work there. But if you hang out with those same people every weekend... When they're drinking Coors and they're smoking weed, it is only a matter of time till you're smoking weed with them. In my surfing career, when I quit smoking weed, I had the best year of my career, and I was recognized by the ASP World Tour as the most improved surfer in the world. And it makes me wonder how different my career had been if I had quit smoking weed before I was 22. All that time I was top 20 in the world smoking weed all the time. And when I was on tour, I hung out with the guys who smoked weed. We'd go to South Africa and we'd find weed in South Africa. We'd go to Australia and it's hard to do, but we could find weed in Australia in the 80s and you could get in a lot of trouble for it. One of the people I hung out with, they found weed in Japan and they got busted at Narita Airport with weed and they served three, three months in prison. And he's a pipe master. Choose your friends wisely. They profoundly affect who you are. And as true as it is when you're 13 at Valley Junior High School, it's just as true when you're 63 in Orange County in 2024. Be careful who we walk with and stand with and sit with. Test all things, hold fast that which is good. What God blesses is the woman who delights herself in God's word. Now, the law of the Lord could really be summarized God's word here as it was understood by David. I do like to think on the Ten Commandments every day so we could take that literally and just say, hey, this is good. my life's going to be great if I understand there, the Lord is the Lord and there is no other. I don't make any graven images, any concepts I have about God that aren't what he's revealed about himself to me. Honor the Sabbath of the Lord. Honor my Father. Don't use his name in vain. Revere his name. Honor my father. When I, when I get discouraged seeing my dad some days when he's fuzzy, I'm just reminded, honor your father and mother that it may be well with you. Don't murder. Don't let the malice hinder. See, this is what it's, when you think about these things during the course of the day when you're at work and you're with your family and your relatives, it, it sets you right. It's a restraint against evil. It's good for you. It's good for our soul. It's a good thing. I literally remind myself of my origin every day. I didn't evolve. I was created in God's image and glory. And I have a purpose, a divine purpose. 
And though it was lost because of sin in Genesis 2, it's restored because of grace in John 3. So I remind myself every day that I'm created with divine design and purpose in his image. Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit said, let us make man in our image and woman too. There's no randomness in our life. I, and then I meditate on how God gave us a moral standard, the Ten Commandments. And then I meditate on how he gave us a second birth in John 3, where Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's a good thing to meditate upon. We must be born again. And then I meditate on what that looks like, divine transformation with the fruit of the Spirit. I cannot produce those nine fruit listed in Galatians 5 in my flesh, but as I yield to the Holy Spirit, you and I both can become more loving, more patient, more peaceful, more self-control, more kindness, more gentleness, more goodness and faithfulness and all the good stuff that's there. It's good to meditate on those things every day. Todos dia tu vida. Every day of your life. It's good to meditate. And can we say yes and amen? For sure. That's where the blessing is, to fill our mind with the word that it guides our heart in the day. And we delight in it. Like, I'm excited to read the word. Like I've mentioned, I'm reading Good News for Modern Man, the paperback New Testament from the 60s right now. I'm so excited. I see a new little stick figure picture. And as I turn the page, I'm like, it takes me back to my, oh, fifth grade. And I'm excited to read the scriptures in this translation right now that all the hippies read, a lot of the hippies read, while sitting under Pastor Chuck in that tent. And I just think like, wow, Greg Laurie at 18, or Steve Mays when he put his clothes on. Because remember in his testimony, he ran the jungle naked. Or that was actually Jeff Johnson, but Steve Mays was different stuff. You know, like, I, I just think like how God speaks through his word. And those men delighted in it, and their wives delighted in it, and they changed the world with the Calvary Movement. And that's part of our legacy tonight. Because they delighted in the law of the Lord and they meditated in the law of the Lord. I think we can safely say one of the things that made Pastor Chuck Smith so great is his mind from the time he was a toddler was filled with the scriptures. Up and down, back and forth, any direction you go. Scripture, scripture, scripture. That's why even when he was going through his cancer in the back end, he could be in the pulpit and he could just bring up so many scriptures because it was in him. We want it to be in you. And as I said, if you go fuzzy and you lose certain elements of your memory as you get older, if you fill up, if your cup of water is filled with scripture and you lose two thirds of it, at least the third that's left will be scripture. But if it's filled with brack water and bad things, who knows what that final third would look like if that's all you have left when you're 93. Fill your mind. Delight in the law of the Lord and meditate it day and night and be fruitful like a tree by the river and bring forth your fruit in due season. What a beautiful psalm. What a way to get started. It's like a road trip. We have a huge, a fantastic national landmark as soon as you begin. There it is. Just right away. What encouragement to begin in the book of Psalm with this one. Delight in the law of the Lord. Meditate in the law of the Lord. And choose your influences wisely and carefully, body of Christ. Now we read on to the second psalm. We move on. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their courts from us. He who sits in heaven, the heavens, shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare to the decree, the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son or pay homage to the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in him. Well, this is definitely a Jesus psalm and a messianic psalm. And it's actually, we go back to back, Psalms 1 and 2 right here, just boom, boom. This is... If we had any doubts it's a Jesus psalm, we don't have to because the New Testament interprets it for us in that way. 
This psalm is quoted a couple times in the New Testament. The ladies might recognize it. I'm not sure how much Susan covered this with the women going through being dynamic in the book of Acts on that first Saturday of the month. But as this psalm goes forth talking about how essentially the rulers of the world rebel against God. They're, they rebel against his authority, his word, his standards, his plans. They're sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, and they rebel against God's righteous standards and the good things he has that will bless the nation. That's primarily the history of humanity with a few rare exceptions. But there in the book of Acts, when the early church was established after the day of Pentecost, and the apostles were preaching there in Jerusalem, and the local church was thriving. It was thousands of people that would meet publicly at a part of the temple there in the worship center for the Jewish people. They were Jewish Christians, and they would change the world by reaching non-Jews for Christ. But at the time, they were primarily Jewish and they were meeting house to house, and they were rejoicing in Jesus, and they were identified with Jesus, the one that their religious leaders had rejected and crucified. So while they had all this joy, and they ate their bread with gladness and simplicity of heart, they did have conflict with the ruling Jewish leaders that were under Roman, Roman authority, but had a bit of their own autonomy, if you will, because the Romans like to keep the peace, and as long as these religious leaders kept the people in check, then the things would go the way they're supposed to. Pay your taxes to Caesar, stay out of trouble, and just let Rome rule the world. Those religious leaders, of course, had crucified Jesus, and his blood was on their hands. He, they said, let his blood be upon us and our children, and it was. But there was a situation where Peter and John were seized by the religious leaders and they were thrown in jail and told to not preach in the name of Jesus. And Peter, who the one in his flesh had denied the Lord, he says, we're going we're gonna to declare Jesus. You know, the religious leaders look at him like, these guys have been with Jesus. These are these Jesus guys. And Peter had confidently proclaimed there is salvation in no other name other than the name of Jesus. So in front of those 70 people that he saw crucify Jesus, he boldly proclaimed Jesus is the only way to heaven. That was Peter, filled with the Spirit, with John, the two of them together. And they were threatened and released. And as they went back to the other apostles and the church, when they shared the threats that were against them, they had like a prayer meeting. The room was shaking, all these the presence of the Lord was there and all these believers felt the presence of the Lord and it was supernatural. But they quoted this passage from Psalms right here, Psalm 2. When they, they quoted this passage to the Lord in a prayer about the threats of the religious leaders against them to not preach in Jerusalem, to not name the name of Jesus. So the apostles quoted this verse right here and they said, you know, the kings of the earth set themselves and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's the Messiah, Jesus, against the Christ. And they say, let us break their bonds in peace and cast away their courts from us. But whether people want Jesus to rule over them or not is a self-determined element in time, but it's a Christ-determined element in eternity. And like we say, you can bow the knee in time and be saved by grace through faith, or you can bow the knee at the throne room and be cast out in outer darkness to your own hell that you created for yourself in unbelief and pride and rebellion. But everyone's going to bow the knee. It's much better to bow the knee in the light. But people resist that. People, people fight the Lord, and people fight the Lord to the end in this brief journey that we call life. They just fight the Lord. So we don't, want, we don't want the word of God over our marriage. We don't, want, we, don't want, we don't even want God blessing our marriage. I did a wedding one time where the bride said to me, D don't mention God at all. So you mean even when we're all said and done, and I say you can kiss the bride and all that, I can't say God bless you guys? She goes, no. That woman said, we will not have God be a part of my marriage at all my wedding day. And he wasn't invited to be a part of her marriage, and thus it didn't last very long, which was quite predictable, really. I mean, if it's still going, we'd say congratulations to you, sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. But, wow, you want Jesus ruling over your marriage. You want Jesus helping you to raise children if you have children. 
You need the wisdom of Jesus to how to minister to your adult children if you have adult children. You just you want Jesus to bless and protect your grandchildren like there's no tomorrow. Above all else, what grandparent here wouldn't jump in front of a bus or a bullet to save the life of your grandchild right now? Yes and amen. If I woke up tomorrow and the Lord said, there's two choices. One of your grandkids can step in eternity or you can jump in front of this bullet and take it. I'm like, where's it going to be? And I'm not just saying that because I'm 63. I just say, A, that's... We want the Lord to rule over us. We're not trying to break off his reign over us. We want him reigning over us. It's, we come here to be reminded of his reign over us when we sing our songs of worship and we receive his word. God forbid that, he'd, that we'd say, oh, we don't want the restraint of the law. We don't want the, the restraint of the Holy Spirit. I'm glad that when we do naughty things, it grieves the Spirit. God forbid it would please the Spirit. Who'd want to go in eternity? If God wasn't holy... How would we, who would we want to serve the Lord? If his throne isn't a just and righteous throne of light, what a horrible universe it would be. But God said, I am holy, and be therefore holy. And he chastens us so we can learn holiness. We want his cords ruling over us, and we want him to spank us when we deserve it. Because as a father loves his children, so much more does the father love us in heaven. There's another New Testament. There's another New Testament passage here too. If you come down to verse seven, where it says, "I have, I will de declare the decree." The Lord has said to me, "You are my son. Today I begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession." This passage is quoted in the New Testament as well. It's quoted by the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, which is considered to be unknown. But when it's quoted in Hebrews chapter one, it is quoted to affirm that Jesus, the Son of God, has the authority over everything in the universe. He's, he's over the angels. He's over everything. He's over it all. Now, the book of Hebrews starts out saying that God had spoke to us in times past, but has in these last days spoken to us through his Son, Jesus. Then right from there, it goes on to quote this passage, saying that though it wasn't completely clearly understood that God has a Son and would send his Son and that God is triune in nature, in the Old Testament, it's clearly understood, it's certainly clearly proclaimed in the New Testament. So this passage is God talking about his son and that he's going to reign and give all things to him. And when Jesus walked the earth, he said, the father loves the son and commits all things to him. He said, the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. And so this passage right here is very important because it is quoted in Hebrews chapter 1 to show the supremacy and the authority of Jesus as the king of kings in the universe God has made. It's also affirmed again in Hebrews chapter 5 as well. It's quoted twice there in the book of Hebrews. It basically says Jesus reigns. And right now he's at the right hand of the Father ever interceding for us as our great high priest. But he's coming. He's coming in glory. And, you know, we're, we're on the parables on Saturday night right now. We've got the parable of the wheat and the tares coming up and some other parables. And let me tell you something. You read those parables every day, they're kind of scary. Because Jesus says, oh, let, let the wheat and the tares go together. But when the, the master comes, you know, it's going to be dealt with. And then he explains that the tares are the, the evil ones, plans of the Lord of the kingdom, and that the angels are coming. They're coming with the Lord. I don't think about that often, but the angels are coming with the Lord to separate the wheat and the tares. That is a very sobering thought. I was thinking like all the alien movies that have existed in my timeline. Back to the 50s in black and white version. There's something in humanity that we like scary aliens. Those are the fallen angels. The ones that are in authority they're the ones evil people should fear. Because Jesus says time and again when he comes, they're going to gather from the east and the west. And the angels are superior to us. They're incredible beings of another dimension. They're not past Pluto, hang a left and go to another galaxy. They come from a whole other dimension. And there's nothing like them. And isn't it nice to know that they're watching over you and me tonight? They are ministering saints sent to those who are being saved, Hebrews 1.14. So how many times were you just about to like get run over or something and angels moved you this way or redirected that way? You don't even know. 
Angels are important, and Hebrews 1 tells us that, but they're not nearly as important as the Son of God who made them. That's why they worship him. That's why the angels never accept worship in the Bible. They always give worship to this Jesus, the anointed one, in Psalm 2. So all eyes on Jesus, and it just reminds us of the supremacy of Christ over everything in the universe, as it should be, including our own souls. Now we read on Psalm 3. Now this psalm, like some psalms, has a footnote that gives us context to it, which is very helpful. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are those who rise against me, rise up against me. Many are they who say to me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Now, in this psalm, these eight verses, there were a few selahs, which means to pause or think. At least that's what the scholars think it means. So after verse 2, there's a selah. After verse 4, there's a selah. And after verse 8, there's a selah. So maybe we can apply that application to realize there's a pause element when those things were said. Psalm 3 is kind of a heavy psalm. It's, you know, it's like one where you're, you would relate to when you're going through really difficult times, like when people have come against you at work, maybe or your family's come against you, you're, you know, you're in charge of the trust or whatever, and they're trying to steal money, and they're coming after you because you're restraining them. Or maybe your co-workers are coming after you. They didn't do the job right, but they're above you, and they're going to throw you under the bus. And they've, they've arranged evidence in such a way where you're the guilty party and you're going you're gonna to bear the wrath of deceitful people, which can happen. Could be false accusations from neighbors where you have HOAs or something. I mean, there's no, there's no limit to where people can increase against you. Look what David said, how they increase who trouble me. That's a very, can we just say, yeah, that's a very, that's a very unsettling verse. I do not like people increasing who trouble me. And I love you enough to say I don't like people increasing trouble for you. I don't want people to increase and cause you trouble. I want people to increase and bring you blessings. Right? You want blessings from me. You don't want troubles to increase from me. I hope not. But we know life brings an increase of trouble. You cannot go forward with the Lord and not have enemies in conflict. The devil hates your guts. And there's plenty of people that serve him that he'll bring against you. At work, you're like, why is this person so against me? They don't even know why they're against you. Because they're being... Provoked by the devil to cause trouble against you. In the case of David, this is very difficult because Absalom was his son, one of his many sons from his many wives that he loved very much. And he wanted Absalom to live and be spared. And Joab did not spare him. Joab killed him. It's a very, you know, we saw the story back when we were going through Samuel. It's a very sad story. Absalom was good looking and just amazing. So much potential, but bitterness avenge his sister who was raped by the half-brother. and just, oh, it's, just a, it's a really sad story. So in this case, in this psalm, it's not just that David has his enemies. We're not talking Philistines here. It's his own adult son as, who led the nation against him. It's really heavy. But I like what he said here. In verse 5, I laid down and slept. And I'm not going to be afraid of 10,000 people surrounding me tomorrow morning. So may I just remind us a thought before we move on from this psalm. When you feel like they just increase who are against you, family, friends, pseudo-friends, foes, neighbors, HOAs, government, anything and everything in between, Isaiah said, he'll keep the imperfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. And Paul said, let the peace of God rule in your heart. And if you're like the woman in Psalm 1 or the man in Psalm 1, delight in yourself in the law of the Lord and meditate it, It'll make a difficult night better. It'll help you sleep. The problems of tomorrow will be there. Listen, we all, you younger people, listen to me. There's things that just tear your soul apart and your heart apart that grieve you and make it hard for you to sleep sometimes. Just arduous things, difficult things, and you just almost can't even sleep. 
But as you grow in your faith and get closer to heaven, you realize God's got this. A hundred years from now, no one will even remember this. They might even remember it a year from now. Things that get so worked up in your mind that cause you grief and sorrow and heartache from people coming against you. You get a few years down the road, you're like, it all worked together for good if you trust in the Lord. You sleep in peace. People steal. People hurt people. People lie about people. People lie all the time. People steal from other people. And people want to ruin other people. But let the Lord be your defense. He said, the Lord is my shield. You are my shield. And I'm going to sleep good tonight. And that's hard. You might have an arbitration tomorrow. You might have a court case next week. You might have a custody battle. They might have a better lawyer than you have. Their lawyer shows up on time. Your lawyer shows up late. I got released from jury duty yesterday. I was on the jury. And I had a, a really good reason to be released. But then the judge said, is there any other reasons you'd be released? I said, yes. I'm going to be prejudiced against the defense's lawyer. And he said, really? How come? I said, because he came seven minutes late. I was there and he walked up to bailiff and he said, I'm sorry I'm late. I said, it's Monday morning. I had to get up at 740. I had to get up at 635 in the dark and do my citizen duties as under the Constitution. I listened to the guy give the speech while I'm doing it. We were all here on time. This guy represents that guy against some, these charges. And I would think if you're going to show up, if you believe he's innocent, you're going to show up on time. And if anything, you show up early. And I said, you're going to bring your end game and have your hustle on. And so this guy didn't do that, and I already think he doesn't believe in his, who he's representing. I was like, I just said that. I can't even believe I just said that. I mean, there's like 60 jurors just went like, what? Did he just say? I was like, it's a mic drop. And the judge, he was awesome. He leaned forward and goes, I've been a judge for 19 years. I've never heard that. You know, you, you know what the lawyer said? She's like, judge, I can, and he's like, save it for later. In the prosecution, she was a woman. She was like, I was like, uh-huh. See, you scare me. Are you, this, you know, you showed up early, and the DA has a case, or they wouldn't be here. This guy showed up seven minutes late on spring four. I had to get up in the dark. I'm getting paid 10 bucks for today. <laughs> He's getting paid 250 for 15 minutes, and he was seven minutes late. I mean, there's grace for everybody. I, they already knew I was a minister, but man, dude, you're my lawyer. You better show up on time. I don't think he thinks he's innocent. <laughs> man, <laughs> you know me, right? I'm like, why did I say that? But I did. Uh, I don't know how it relates to the text, but I just wanted to share that story. Just be, you can pray for me. You know, whenever I get jury duty, I go, don't say anything that's going to get you in trouble. And every time something like that happens, Sam, got, Sam had jury duty, and he got on his jury. He's on a jury right now. They, they released me. <laughs> you know, hey, 105, 37, and 52, you guys have a great, you, did, you fulfilled your obligation. Have a great week. Because sometimes you got to go to court, and your lawyer's not as good as the other one. And you know your lawyer's not as good as the other one. You just got to believe that the Lord's bigger than a bad lawyer. The Lord's bigger than a false charge. The Lord's bigger than an HOA. And the Lord's bigger than, we talk about personally for you, like cancer, things like that. God's bigger than all that. But I'm talking about people coming against you. You just got to know God's bigger than that. You just got to know that the Lord is your shield. And the difficult thing about accusations and people coming against you, and we've talked about this, is more often than not, there might be an element of truth to it, but it's been twisted in such a, a horrible way to really be misunderstood in attacking you. That's the worst part of it, because we're all sinners, and we all say things we shouldn't have said, we've all done things we shouldn't have done, and we've all been misunderstood. That's the worst thing about it. Uh, a false accusation is almost always there's some kind of little bit of element of truth to it, and that's what makes it hurt even more. But we gotta always remember, this is the beauty of being under the blood of Christ and saved by grace and saved through faith. Jesus is our shield. And wherever our confidence in men would suffer because of their lack of professionalism or folly, we got to know God's bigger than that. We're trusting Jesus to raise us from the grave. I can assure you he's better, he's bigger, he better be bigger than the lawyer that shows up seven minutes late to defend you. All right, one more psalm tonight. 
Psalm 4. To the chief musician with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. Hear me when I call, O God, my righteousness. You've relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than the season that their grain and wine increased. I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Just another one of those. The Davidic Psalms are just so beautiful. And again, he's wrestling with these people that were coming against him. We don't know the full context. How long, verse 2, will you turn my glory to shame? You seek falsehood and you come against me, but the Lord hears me when I call. And I think verse 4 and 5 really get our attention for a closing thought and application. Be angry and do not sin. We're told that. There's things that make us angry, and rightfully so, but we don't want our anger to turn to sin. We want it to turn to obedience with the Lord and how that, that emotion can be channeled passionately for good things for a better end, for justice in the human experience, whatever it would look like according to God's word. And then it says, meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Now we saw meditate earlier on back in chapter, excuse me, Psalm number one, but here it's like meditate on your bed. And so we, we close with this thought tonight about when we're on our bed at night, because this, this implies evening time, like meditate on your bed. And again, we were just talking about it in Psalm three, sometimes you can't sleep because you're just, your stomach's in knots because of, the, this situation, or maybe you've had fraud, someone stole your checks and did fraudulent stuff, or they got your credit card and did this stuff, and I've had all those things in the last few years, um, multiple times actually, and you just can get, oh, like, because nothing gets your stomach turning like someone's stealing your money, right? For real. And, and it, ah, oh. and you can just fret, and you can lay there in bed and flip and flop back and forth, and what David is saying here, the Holy Spirit through David, what God is saying to us is, Slow it down and be still. The mind can be very noisy. Slow it down. Slow it down, especially someone like me. Whenever I trip over my words in the pulpit, it's because I've got six lanes merging into three in my mind. I have six thoughts in three lanes. So whenever I trip a word, you're like, ah. Yeah, it's like by LAX. And so it just happened to me. My mind can go like this, and I've learned to discipline myself to how to be still. We're going to see this a lot in the Psalms, to be still and know that the Lord is God. Now, we might have different ways we slow our mind down at night. My wife, Jennifer, what she does is she meditates on the alphabet names of Jesus, like Alpha and Omega, Bread of Life. Wow. And she just goes over and over it. Keith Randolph, in his book, 100 Secrets of Success, talks about how he meditates on some biblical things over and over to slow down his mind. I meditate in foreign languages. I do colors, numbers, people, nouns, and I, I slow it all down with languages, and then I come back to the most recent text that I'm studying, getting ready to teach. But I, I count upwards and backwards in Russian. I go colors in Russian. I go colors in Spanish. I go numbers in Spanish to a million. I go numbers in Korean. I go colors in Korean. I go pronouns in Korean. I, I, I Sometimes I go through three languages for 20 minutes to slow my mind down to divine purpose, created with divine purpose, 10 commandments, divine standard, second birth, John 3.16, <laughs> divine recreation, and then fruit of the spirit, divine transformation. Oh. <laughs> you gotta learn to slow your mind down. Wh whatever it takes, you want to fill your mind with thoughts of the Lord and you want to slow it down and you want to take the big, big problems and put them, make them small when you put them before big God and the promises of God. That's what you want to do. We're all different how we slow down our mind. We're all different how we can meditate and reel it in and merge into just one lane with a clear thought. But God help us to do that because Jesus didn't die on the cross so we can flip-flop all night. 
in fear of men, in fear of anxiety and the things of the unknown. He died on the cross and rose from the grave so he can sleep peacefully and face the next day in his strength, in his power, and with his promises. Yes and amen. Lord, we thank you for your word here tonight, and we thank you for these four psalms that get us going in the first book of Psalms attributed to David, your servant David, and we thank you for it. And some different applications here, but Lord, I would just pray that we would choose the right friends and influences and really recognize when we're coming under the influence of things that are contrary to you and take those thoughts captive and reject them. I also ask and pray, Lord, that we would truly delight in your word and meditate in your word and let it transform us and it be our joy and our passion. Like we'd be excited to read our Bible in the morning. We'd be excited to read it in the afternoon maybe or listen to K-Wave in commuter traffic or anything like that. Like we'd be, we'd be joyful and excited for that. And Lord, maybe perhaps some of us feel like we are being our enemies are increased. Many are those who come against us. And maybe someone in the room here tonight, or uh, more than someone, uh, feels like the, the enemies are, are growing. There are more of them, and they're, and they're conspiring. And they're conspiring against your people tonight. And I just pray, Lord, that you would give peace to anyone going through that. That they would be reminded in Psalm 3 that you are their shield. And you gave David a good night's sleep where he wasn't afraid of 10,000 coming against him. And even the heartache of his own son leading it he still slept in peace, and he could recount your faithfulness in the past to be assured of the present. And then, Lord, that uh, fourth psalm we see, we're just, oh, man, Lord, that we just slow it down and be still. We live in such a busy, noisy world. I ask and pray, Lord, you would just help us as we go through these psalms and as we go forward out of the, you know, toward the second quarter of the year and out of the first quarter after we clear Easter, you would just keep helping us to just Ah, oh, just keep it, keep the cadence in the right gear and not get worked up and not be in a frenzy, especially in election year. Just have peace and know you're in control and just be still and hear your voice and know your person and be sure of your promises and face each thing with peace and promises and the power of God. So those are some good applications for us tonight. I pray you would help us to apply them to our life and just go forward in a wonderful way. Thank you for this first night in Psalms. Bless the rest of our week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's all stand with Danny for this uh, closing song. As always, available for prayer afterwards. Hope you have a great rest of the week, and I hope as we went through those announcements for the rest of the month that you can be a part of some of those events. God bless you all. Father, you always amaze me. Let your kingdom come in my world and in my life. Give me the food I need to live through today. And forgive me as I forgive the people that wrong me. Lead me far from temptation, deliver me from the evil one. I look out the window, the birds are composing, not a note is out of tune or out of place. To the meadow and stare at the flowers better dressed than any girl on her wedding day so why should i worry why do i freak out god knows what i you know what I need, your love is 
God bless you. Have a great rest of the week.